Our next reader is Miranda Stewart. She graduated from Cutstown University with a bachelor's in writing focusing on poetry. Her work has been published in the Barefoot Review and the Red River Review. She looks forward to summer already, enjoys delicious <laughs> vegan recipes. You've got a long way, my friends. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to winter yet. Um, she loves vegan recipes. Days when she doesn't have to use the PA Turnpike, pumpkin flavored anything, and dreams of drinking tea with Allen Ginsberg. <laughs> Please welcome Miranda Stewart. That's what you call professional biography. <laughs> okay. So my first piece here, I guess I could call it my autumn piece too. Um, it's called November. When it gets cold, he grows a beard overnight, wakes up covered, startling me every year, and soon the air conditioners are no longer teetering in our windows. He has lifted them out and shouldered them up into the attic. It, the leaves start to turn, and he finds his axe in the garage, that mysterious grave site for old truck parts, lawnmowers, weed whackers, spriggets and sproggets, paint cans, oil. All these things are assumptions on the part of a wife who anxiously dreams of gray sweaters and flannel sheets. He is not worried about sheets or pumpkin bread, Christmas cookies, wrapping paper, wool socks. No, he finds the axe and with his beard and a pair of Carhartt overalls begins to chop and stack the wood until the sun goes down. He smiles, not with his lips, but with the steady concentration of two furrowed brows. He smiles with his back, hoisting the axe into the sun and back down again. He smiles with his hands, calloused by years of touching metal and concrete dirt, pipes, PBR, wood, <clears throat> rust, and glancing at his gloves, I suddenly feel like I should be wearing a dress, baking a pie or some meatloaf, cleaning the bathroom, sewing a jacket. Instead, I grab the mail from the mailbox and keep quiet about the buck and the tomatoes. <laughs> okay, so since it was, uh, I, ha I had to do a, you know, a Veterans Day poem, so. This one's called how to be a widow. I look at my mother who has been watching me for the entire hour since we have arrived, making sure that I don't jump onto the coffin as they pull the red, white, and blue tight off of the top, each corner held by a man who I know, each one who heard the ammunition spread over him, each one who saw him take to his knees like the day he proposed in front of everyone on the beach with a fire and the seagulls, shells, crabs, sand, beer, and they were there too, clapping their hands and smiling. Or like the day he broke his knee up open on the lawnmower. The day he burned himself picking up the Griswold with his bare hands to make me breakfast in bed for my birthday. And I can't believe that he's in there. He's got to be home making me breakfast. I should be home with him. I can't see him in there. That he was eaten up in military boots and a helmet that didn't do him any good. And what they did for us I can't see. I can't see anything. Only his brothers holding up the flag and jagged movements. Stiff with thoughts and courage and honor and desperation. They fold it into a shape I should know, but there is no room for shapes right now. Their wives stare at me in horror, in regret, in relief. And whatever women who still have their husbands to be sent out again and again feel until the captain places the flag in their laps and says that he is sorry. And I don't know what for, for greasy egg knees, for broken lawnmowers and burnt coffee pots, for children, for tomato gardens, for weddings and honeymoons, for morning sex and evening sweet corn, for all the things that are now restricted to three colors folded on my lap or are quiet between brothers. People hand me things. I think they are flowers or voices or hands touching my hands. And I look at my mother who warns me to remember what has really happened here. But I don't know what has happened here or anywhere or at home where he might be making me breakfast, even though it's almost dinner. But then again, things never happen in a fashion that requires believing like a husband home, or a mother's comfort, or flowers, voices, hands. This one's called Praying for Curry. Sometimes I pray for curry, for something more than or just different from the taste of you, you on my pillow, you in my soup, 
small curly hairs all over the soap bar, popcorn kernels sewn into the carpet, dried ketchup on the kitchen table, toenails dotting the bathroom sink. Of course, I would never want anything else, just the smell of curry every once in a while, or the luxury of something that you hate, like hummus, leeches, stargazing, or curry, curry, curry for soup, curry for potato soup, because there is more to life than salt and pepper, walking into doors and walking out. And I can tell that we've gone too far when I don't even hide the Captain Morgan when my grandmother comes to visit. When she is here and I forget to put the ring on that my great-great-grandmother had, we stop going to pumpkin patches for pumpkins and Christmas tree farms for Christmas trees, going from your parents to my parents to your parents to my parents. It must happen to every couple, the falling into a smothering comfort, smothering curryless comfort, just whatever makes waking up easier, whatever might make you want me after all these years. Instead, we value the size of our couch and sleeping in by 8 o'clock or discovering the other slipper or a new brand of coffee, <laughs> different colors on the can, the buying of a freezer to keep all the practiced foods, the meat and vegetables, meat and vegetables. We will pull them out and say, oh, we have corn, and I will make the corn. <laughs> and you will say, where is the meat? Where is the meat? And I will dig down further and bring it up. <laughs> your allergies make you sound like you're crying in the other room. When I look, you're just watching TV and haven't touched your soup. <laughs> this one's called Dear Grandmother. You visited my house three days ago and brought me a panellini cake and a box of seven assorted donuts from the Amish, and suddenly I know why I was such a chubby child. <laughs> why you called me Wutzer Tootser, taking me in as a PA Dutch little piggy up to the farm while my mother worked to buy me cereal and toilet paper. I think that you tried again with me after raising five children of your own during the years when Coca-Cola actually fizzed with cocaine, locking my mother in the basement until your husband could come home with a belt. It wasn't the whooping that hurt, it was the waiting for him to come home. Sometimes it was the belt, sometimes a wooden paddle with holes cut into the middle to let the air through during a good swing. Neither of you ever hit me after climbing pine trees until the tops bent me back down to the ground, dropping rocks onto snakes in the garden, beating the barn cat silly with brooms. I hated you, grandmother, for years, and I'm not sure why, but back then I hated everybody. Locked away in the mountains with nothing to do but watch you slump over puzzles on the front porch, or clean, or pull weeds, or make me lunch. We never talked about those years that I hated you and your soapy buckets. Now you visit my house from the Cape May shore, bringing me cakes, and we drink coffee to the world from both ends with a sudden understanding that we'll never have any of it back. The buckets, the puzzles, the snakes, or the shaped macaroni and cheese, vanilla bean ice cream, pork and sauerkraut, weeds and mountains. Okay, so this poem, I just have to read because the last time that I read it, I printed it out and I left the last page somewhere <laughs> and didn't realize it until I was reading it and was so into it and got to the end and up. <laughs> so this is the redemption for this poem, especially since this is probably the last time I'll be able to read here since I'm graduating soon. Um, it's a sequence piece, so if there's a little bit of a pause, I'm not being awkward, it's just a pause. <laughs> so, this is called Father Stories. The phone was my worst enemy because he couldn't stay sober enough to visit, to make the drive, to sit still enough long enough without falling over, but he could still pick up the phone and blast himself across the world to me, at me, any time, and I was always unprepared and so never answered. He'd leave a message and its red eye would blink at me from across the room, across the yard, in my sleep, and I desperately wanted him to stop trying, but I think that's all he knew how to do, and I'd answer once or twice to hear nothing but to try. My sister comes upstairs to ask me why I never visit, and I say, because I hate our father. She disagrees as if she knows, and I want to tell her blue-eyed dancer legs to go clean out her gerbil's cage, or worry about homework, cleaning her room, soccer practice, anything that's not making me sick of myself. My stepmother comes upstairs and sees us sitting there on the bedroom floor. She never says a word. She is, after all, only a stepmother, like only a half of something not quite good enough. 
none of us really ever were. Maybe that's what my father always needed, that constant half step to keep him from realizing the ground. The three of us get ready together, even though I want to leave, but we know this is something none of us can run away from anymore. As if the air has turned into him, his breath run at, right under our noses, soaked in familiarity so close that we can hear the clinking of ice in his dead weight glass. Your father was, my stepmother starts as if she needs to tell me, but I've been here the longest. I was the first. I know his thoughts, which never got me anywhere. I cleaned up the blood. I unloaded the gun, unpoured the drink. I am him, and everything else is nothing to me. Everything happens for a reason, especially Jack Daniels. I water my flowers with it, watch the peppers pop up, 80 proof, caramelized oak wooden barrel blueberries. It's how I wash my dishes, my daughter. It's how I remember everything tucking me into bed at night so that I can get her on the bus in the morning. My father leans over and kisses me on the head, and that's when I realize that I'm already sleeping. That's it for me. Thank you very much.